All right, Max, go ahead whenever you are ready. All right. I want to welcome everybody tonight to this critical conversation. A social work conversation on racial justice during COVID-19. This is just the beginning. It's critical for us as social workers to continue to talk to each other and to others and to have critical and crucial conversations. We're going to hopefully have other conversations, including conversations in your regions. Um, but I want you to know that NASW is here for you. And if you want to talk, please call the office, please hit an extension and um, let us know how we can help. So with that, um, I'm very excited that you're here. Um, this is a solemn conversation and I'm going to turn it over to Algeria Wilson, the Director of Public Policy for NASW. And again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Max, for opening mm -hmm. things up for us to have this conversation. Um, and thank you for just your leadership and having the courage to allow us to have this conversation. It is very critical, as you mentioned in the beginning. Um, I just want to remind people um, as we begin to start this conversation that everyone is going through various different feelings right now. And I think the main important thing we want to ensure that we create during this call is just a safe space. Um, people are dealing with, you know, um, their history, the past, um, they're being triggered right now. This is very traumatic for a lot of folks. Um, we're living racial injustice everywhere. And some people for the first time, um, they're actually realizing that they need to deal with their own privilege. Um, and it can be a lot, just remembering that um, the pain of what your ancestors have gone through or even the pain um, that your ancestors may have caused on others, especially black communities. So like I said, I wanna make sure that this, this is a safe space. So I just wanna go over a few meeting expectations for today. Um, like I mentioned, we'll, we're getting ready to start our call. Um, all of our attendees are gonna be muted upon entrance of the meeting. Um, so please keep your phone on mute throughout the whole call and so we can reduce uh, background, background noise. Uh, we want to make sure that folks can participate, but as Dwayne mentioned, we have um, exceeded um, the number of participants who are going to be on this call today. We've had a thousand folks uh, sign up. So we will ask that if you want to speak to please raise your hand. Um, and you can do that by clicking the participants button and there's a raise hand button um, that you can select. Uh, we'll place comments and resources in the chat box. And if you have comments or resources, please feel free to share those in the chat box as well. Um, also, uh, attendees, you're welcome to use the clap or hands or thumbs up button if you agree with something or disagree with a statement that was said. But um, this is a very important conversation that we wanna have. We wanna make sure that um, we hold enough space for folks. We wanna make sure that uh, we hear from um, our black community on the call today, um, communities of color. We wanna make sure that we're just cognizant of the space that we're taking up um, as we go throughout this. So we will start here um, with just a, a moment of silence for uh, the lives that were lost. And then we're gonna go into a mindfulness exercise to kind of set the, set the tone. So if we could all just take a moment to think about all the lives that were lost, um, whether it's someone you know or um, someone that we've seen in the media here. Okay. 
thank you all for taking that moment of silence in your own spaces to remember all the lives that we've lost. Um, it's been quite a lot, especially if we want to consider 400 years worth. Um, so I will transition this over to Michelle uh, Madison, who is our board member, who is going to lead us into a mindfulness exercise to get started. Michelle, go ahead. Thank you so much, Algeria. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the call. Um, I'm hoping that we can have a very fruitful conversation, a very difficult conversation. Um, but before we jump into that, I just want to touch base on the idea of tension and how if we don't do something with tension in our body, it becomes pain. And the things that we're going to discuss on this call are specific to the pain of Black people for over 400 years. And before we enter into this mindful exercise, which is going to be mindful breathing, I want you to take a moment to analyze everything occurring in your body from the physical aspect. Maybe the space between your eyebrow is pinched. Maybe your jaw is clenched. Maybe your shoulders are shrugged. Notice the place in your body where there's tension. Focus into that and release. By releasing, we return to the breath. Our lungs, our heart, our mind. When we engage all of these, we become intentional. We become humble. We become honest. And the goal is not just transparency, but what do we do with this transparency? this mode of action. Take a nice deep breath in, filling in through the belly, allowing the chest to rise, and then release, exhale. And then let's do it again. Nice deep inhale, belly breathing, inhale through the nose. Allow the chest to expand, and exhale, release through the nose as well. When we give our bodies time to sit in silence, we start noticing, we start observing. What is there? What is within you right now? Once you've identified it, come back to the breath. As we enter into this difficult conversation, we must prepare ourselves to feel our emotions and not react to them. And that way, we learn how to use them for the greater good of humanity. One more deep, hell in, deep inhale in through the nose. There it is. Exhale out the nose. As we have this conversation, be cognizant of what is going on in your body. Notice the areas of tension that come up physically. And remember, if you don't deal with the tension, it becomes pain. So let's be compassionate towards the pain that might come out of this conversation and make sure that this is a space for action and release. One more deep inhale, in through the nose. Then exhale, release. Thank you. That was so powerful. I feel so re refreshed and renewed. <laughs> Good, good, good. Nobody, no one else on the call. But that was wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'm ready to get into it. Yes. So, we want, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about, you know, why we wanted to hold this call um, and the importance of it. And I think we have a crowd, a huge crowd of social workers. Um, so, some of you are aware of systemic oppression. Um, and how it operates, and um, some of you may not know as well as you want to know. So we wanted to, like I said again, hold space for conversation, but also try to unpack a little bit of the historical context and, and the, reason, the reason for this call and the work that we do. Um, so we were in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, COVID-19, novel coronavirus, and in Michigan here, we saw black communities specifically, I try not to use the, the term uh, communities of color, 
uh, think it's important to really um, call it what it is. So we saw our black communities, our Latinx communities, um, especially our, our black communities, hit the hardest uh, with COVID-19. And we saw, um, you know, poverty increase, and we saw um, health disparities expand. And um, people were wondering, well, why did this happen? Um, and we know that there are systems and things in place that um, continue to oppress black communities um, in our policies um, and implicit bias when we go to the hospital, um, when people don't believe us, when we say that we're hurting and we're in pain. Um, and so that was just one of the, one of the things that kind of got us to where we are now. But on top of um, COVID-19, we started to see more black deaths um, at the hands of police and police brutality. And we know that the way in which both happened isn't new. Um, we know police brutality isn't uh, something that just happened in 2020. We know that um, health disparities um, and black lives being uh, killed and murdered um, by various different means, even if it's the healthcare system, is not new. Um, but what is new is the space in which we are in to be able to tackle this, right? Um, me as a black woman, a, a black policy director in this space, like this is my community um, and this is who I am. And I couldn't sit back and say like, well, we don't need to have this conversation. Um, I come from a community um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, Woodlawn, but very close to Lincoln Heights, which was the first African American um, city of wealth, and we had to watch it deteriorate. I've had to watch my own community go into gentrification and watch these systemic factors um, create more oppression on my personal community. And so, being here and being in this role, I thought it was important to have this conversation. Um, and I think it's also to, important to note that um, folks are really at, are pumped up about, you know, how can I help and, and you know, what actions can I take as it relates to um, criminal justice or criminal legal reform or abolition um, to be able to step up for racial justice. Um, but racial justice work happens across systems. So it happens beyond just the criminal legal space. The criminal legal space is very important for us to focus on um, because we know how it affects so many other systems, our education system, healthcare system, mental health system, um, our children, our youth. Um, and so it's one space, but we need folks everywhere. Um, we need folks advocating just beyond the criminal legal system for racial justice. Um, and we need you to work on educating yourself um, I know I sent out a newsletter to members about this topic, and I really urged our white women um, and within the professional social work to really um, step up to the call, not only because our profession is so heavily dominated in um, white women, um, and not only because African Americans are, um, we're going to always be resilient and always um, you know, take a break and get back in the work. Um, but we are exhausted. And what we're saying is, you know, now is your time to be a true ally. Um, or what I've seen lately is accomplice in the work, um, to stay committed to the work and committed across systems. Um, and this isn't really a call to educate you all on, you know, where police came from, right? Like as slave catchers and things of that sort in the past and um, educate you all on um, African-American oppression. Um, it's really just to have a conversation. And I would put it back on you all to kind of do that work. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, we can work together. Um, but many of us, as I mentioned, have been, um, and I don't want to speak for the African-American community, because we are not monolithic. I can only speak to my experiences. Um, but I do think that we do share a set of um, 
just cultural experiences that I think are relevant that I can bring to this conversation. But um, I do think that, uh, you know, because of um, difficulty in finding our own um, education and knowledge about our own history, we're still constantly learning that, learning how to heal from um, 400 years of uh, oppression and abuse um, in black death. And so we call on you all to also um, engage in some of that learning so that you can uh, grow from, you know, your ancestors' mistakes um, and that we can all collectively be, be better. Um, I think that the role of social work um, also has a lot of inward work to do, right, as a profession. Um, and I mentioned in my letter we have a lot of uh, times we see people in the profession just wanting to help. Um, and sometimes we call that saviorism, right, like wanting to swoop in and help and um, thinking we can fix the world um, and then exiting and leaving um, before really being able to put the power back in the hands of the folks that need it. It's not our job to save communities, but it's our job to remind communities of uh, the power in which they hold for themselves in order to do this work and um, to be um, their best selves. Um, so that's the purpose of this call, is to really also just check in with social workers and provide resources to you all about what you can do now um, and how we can be committed to this in the long run. Um, because NASW, uh, especially our Michigan chapter, we're committed to this. We're a small staff, but we need our members as well. And we need folks out there working um, to dismantle this system. <laughs> Uh, I am. Sure. I just had one of my friends join, <laughs> and I see you there. Hey. Um. So, this work is is large. It's a lot. It's it's. Um. I'm not saying anything new, especially uh, for our Black communities. Um, what we need for other social workers to do, especially white social workers, is to listen and to hear us um, and, to, and to hear what we're saying that we need and then to go out and um, to act um, based on what we say we need. Uh, I think, unfortunately, too often uh, we will not be heard and uh, other recommendations based on um, goodwill and good intention will happen. Um, but it's important to listen. So today I'm hoping that as we have our discussion, um, we can hear from, um, like I said before, some our black social workers um, to figure out how we can collectively go forward and um, make change happen. Um, I think that also racism and confronting our own, your own privilege is very difficult. It is uprooting and um, it can feel confrontational. But I really do believe that um, in order to face something, in order to uproot something, to start over, uh, we have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And so we have to get comfortable uh, with being uncomfortable in the field of social work and really begin to address the ways in which our research the ways in which our um, our systems, our policies are created to um, further perpetuate oppression. And we need every social worker in every agency to call this out, um, to work, work on these initiatives, um, to advance policy, to look at funding mechanisms, to really be able to support black communities and so that we can be, as we all say, in social work more preventative um, and focus on healing and focus on what's really needed, um, especially if we truly believe that black lives matter. That's the purpose of this call today. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time just talking about what we're doing um, as a chapter to focus on systemic um, oppression and systemic um, just racial injustice initiatives. So I mentioned before that um, Tackling racism and systemic oppression is something that needs to be done beyond just a criminal legal system. 
Um, so as a policy director and as a staff, we focus on various different initiatives. Right now, as it relates to um, the criminal legal system, what we're doing is we're supporting social workers um, and we help them get involved in the jail and pretrial on incarceration task force that our governor created to um, really begin to look at the reasons why our community in Michigan um, was over incarcerated. From that initiative, we saw that behavioral health reasons um, and low ticketed offenses, uh, driver license offenses, things of that sort, poverty issues were the reasons why more of our folks were going um, to jail. But we also support social workers who are doing this work on the ground. Um, and we support folks like the Center on Behavioral Health and Justice down at Wayne State University who's really leading the way on a lot of the criminal legal work across the state in the uh, field of social work. Um, we're also supporting increasing social workers into the law enforcement area, which for some um, people may not understand that um, or may not support it, but you know, having a social worker uh, with a police officer to remind folks of the behavioral health challenges that individuals have can really help reduce incarceration. Uh, you know, I came into this work um, working in a public defender's office as my first internship, um, doing alternative sentencing. Uh, so we support social workers in public defender's offices. Uh, we've created a criminal legal work group here um, in our office to really look at some of the criminal legal work um, and reforms that are needed until we can get to a space of, of abolition or we can get to a space where we don't need the criminal justice system. Um, we've also supported um, LGBTQ trainings for social workers who work in our jails and juvenile justice work. Um, recently, you may have seen in the news um, the passage of Senate Bill 945, which really focused on um, training law enforcement in mental health um, techniques and mental health trainings and implicit bias. Um, so we supported legislation like that. We sit on the steering committee for the Mission Collaborative to End Mass Incarceration, um, and that's a group of several organizations, but I highly encourage you um, to look into that group um, and see in ways in which you can get involved, um, not only with the organization, but maybe with some of the other organizations that are a part of that. So like I said before, when it comes to dismantling the system, we have to be everywhere. Um, so we're focused on behavioral health initiatives and um, child welfare initiatives and um, trying to make sure that funding is in the spaces that it needs to be, um, especially the preventative spaces, uh, so that our children and our, our families aren't incarcerated, but also so they're not continuously oppressed in various different systems that keep families apart. Um, because we know far too often on a historical context, African-American families were continuously separated. And so we wanna do whatever we can to make sure um, that we're not perpetuating that. But there are spaces that we could continue to do better on. Um, no one is perfect, uh, and it's a lot of work uh, to show up to these spaces and places. We definitely need to do more on uh, environmental justice and on immigration, because um, we know that our, um, there are black communities everywhere, right? We have um, a large, diverse state and so we just need to focus on everything and dismantling racial justice in various different spaces. Um, I would also say our MPACE, which is our political action committee, uh, we focus on getting the right people elected, uh, focusing on um, you know, trying to make sure that we have people in office who are really gonna deal with these issues, not only just the state level, but we also look at local folks as well. Um, people who are running for prosecutor, people who are running for county commissioner, because we know they're the ones who allocate um, funding or look at allocating funding to communities. Um, so we try to be very cognizant, um, and there's a space and a place for everyone at the table. Um, and 
I would highly encourage you to just continue to find your place in your space in this movement um, because we need it everywhere. Um, so we also created just, um, I don't want to talk about all the work that we're doing, um, but I really want to highlight um, some other ways in which you all can get involved. Um, we created a resource guide, and I don't know if Duane can show this link here or not, um, but if not, I believe he'll put it in the chat. Oh, there it is. Um, it's a racial justice action kit that we created, and it's just kind of a compilation of resources uh, so social workers can educate themselves, but also resources where they can inform themselves on various different initiatives and policies and, and ways to get involved in acts, whether it's donating funds, writing a letter, um, you know, organizing a um, book club. There are micro actions, meso actions, and um, macro actions on ways to get involved. Um, there's articles and readings for you individually so you can get up to date. And this is a compilation of resources from various different folks, um, NABSW, um, from the Office of Raquel Castaneda Lopez, um, and a few others. So please, please look at that resource um, and figure out ways in which you can take action. Also, we really wanted to highlight um, a way in which you can donate today. Um, D Detroit Justice Center runs and operates uh, the largest uh, bail fund in the state of Michigan. And as we look at various different protests across the state and across the nation, but especially across the state, uh, we really want to encourage social workers to donate if they can and provide funds to the Detroit Justice Center so they can continue to do their legal work um, of helping folks uh, get out of jail right now. Um, they're an amazing um, organization and a strong um, ally of ours. And so we have a donation button up on our Facebook page. Um, and if you are able to donate, please donate. Um, Dwayne has just put that in the chat box for you all as well. So some people may have different feelings about the protests, and I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Um, and I'll touch on one other topic after that before I, I switch it over to um, Max to, to kind of lead the discussion. Um, but I know we've had some questions come in um, from social workers, and you may have seen even on online, um, why are people protesting or burning down buildings or whatever? Um, we're talking about years and years of rage of uh, just black communities not being treated fairly. The country was, in many cities, were built on the hands of blacks, uh, of black people. And um, we are constantly reminded in society that property is more important than um, black lives. And so what do we need to do in order to remind folks that black lives really do matter? They matter over capitalism and over opening up states quickly in order to fund and fuel everything. Like, we need to understand that um, we really, we do matter. And so you're going to see protests and you're going to see um, maybe some, um, you know, burning of buildings. But it's also important to note that in various cities, um, some of the burning and um, moving of places are not being done by black folks. Um, so I would just encourage you all to really dig deep into that. Um, and, and kind of try to figure out where that's coming from. Uh, but the importance is if you are committed to understanding that black lives matter, 
that our black communities are over incarcerated, um, we would highly suggest you to donate to the bail project. Um, I know in other states, um, there's a, a pretrial period, and if you don't have the funds to be bailed out, you're going to sit in the, in the jail um, for that time uh, during pretrial period, um, and that's if there isn't a backlog, right? Um, so creating funds for folks to get out of jail is very important right now. Um, Detroit Justice Center, they also advocate for divesting and investing. So you may have heard um, lately defund the police. And I don't really want to speak on behalf of other advocates and their work that they're doing. I think it's really important that folks connect with those organizations who are calling for those things. Um, and but I will say um, the overarching um, theme or message for defunding the police or divesting and investing is to not invest so heavily in our criminal legal system, our criminal justice system, our police officers, but to use that funding um, for social services, for uh, community organizations that really have holistic approaches and can really provide better care for our black communities, um, to reinvest in uh, organizations that are um, run by African Americans within our community. Um, so that is the overarching theme when you hear defund the police. It doesn't mean that, uh, at least for some organizations, it doesn't mean that they don't want the police. Um, some organizations are more abolitionist and truly believe that um, there is not a need for any police officers. Um, but mostly what they're saying is invest in social services, invest in our communities. Um, and so I think this is a huge moment for the field of social work and for social workers. If we can uh, move funds from the police and over to other areas um, to be able to really, really focus on what's needed in our communities, I think that could be huge, whether it's moving um, money from the police offices to further amp up um, our public education system or whether it's to um, move funding from there to amp up our child welfare services or um, maybe it's TANF, I don't know, uh, various different things. Um, some folks want to defund the police or divest in the police and invest in other ways to keep communities safe. Um, job development, various different things. So um, just take a moment to look at what these organizations are saying before you just automatically say no. Um, this isn't something that should be done. Um, so I just wanted to spend time talking about that. So uh, I think we're at the point, Max, where we can really okay. start to have some conversation from social workers. So some of you all um, sent in some questions. So I want to kind of open the, the floor um, to start our conversation by just reading a few questions that we received. Um, Algeria. Algeria, yeah. can I say a few words first before we start the discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I, I want to say this. Um, I think it's really critical um, that a starting point for all of us, especially those of us who are white, is that we really work hard to examine our own racism. I make a statement that we're all racist. And the minute we say we're not, we stop doing our work. Part of the discussion tonight um, must lead to some introspection as well as remedies. Um, so I, I wanted to say that, and um, we're a strong group, we're social workers. And as we come together, we can make a difference. And that's why we're here tonight, I believe, is that we all want to make a difference. Um, these discussions cannot stop tonight. We cannot sit idly by. We need to keep talking and keep having crucial conversations. This is, for many of us, a beginning, for some of us, a continuation. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Algeria. Yeah, thanks, Max. Um, we definitely can't sit idly by. Um, and for uh, 
uh, communities of color, I mean, black, our black communities, when we go places, um, especially in the policy space, we're dismantling systems just by being present. Um, and that's important to note. And I think it's also important to note that, you know, when um, we're no longer protesting in the streets, our black people are still going to be black and we're still going to need, um, we're still going to be faced with racism if we don't tackle this in this moment. Uh, so I want to start with a question that we received from um, a person who actually was going to be joining us from Chicago. And I just want to start with this question because I think it's very um, reflective of other uh, communities as well. And hopefully we can try our best to answer these, this question. Um, we're not a, a master at anything, but we're going to try our best here. So it says, the community we serve and work in is the second most violent neighborhood in Chicago, a 98% poverty rate. I watched last Sunday as the people we serve looted and destroyed the stores in their community. I have a deep understanding of what led to these actions, but now I feel powerless as to what to do to begin to help uh, rebuilding, how to come alongside them. Our seniors are very afraid because they have nowhere to shop. The stores are devastated. There is anger and sorrow. And now on top of everything else, gang violence has amped up. I should also add that I'm a white pastor slash social worker in an all black and brown congregation. So the way I approach this is everything. I love our community and do not ever want to cause further harm. I need suggestions on how do we begin to approach rebuilding. Um, it's such a deep question. Um, I think that for white folks who are in communities that have um, been devastated due to, um, you know, buildings being burned down or looting being caused, I think it's, it's unfortunate, especially when there is Black-owned communities, right? But I do think, I mean, Black-owned businesses, but I do think that, um, you know, you sharing your resources, you sharing your power, you sharing your knowledge, you sharing your funding to help begin to rebuild those communities, to stand side by side, um, brick by brick, to help rebuild when it comes time to rebuilding, to show up, to not disappear, um, to be present, to be vulnerable, to admit that you don't know everything, um, but to show up and to help and to rebuild um, based on what um, the community is saying that they're needing. Um, I think so. Um, I think back to a time in uh, my own city, city of Cincinnati, uh, when um, from 1995 to 2001, there were uh, 17, really over 17 Black Lives murders uh, by the hands of police. Um, and the last life that was lost was a 12 year old boy um, named Timothy Thomas, and the city broke out into riots. Um, and there was looting and destruction. And unfortunately, when it came time to rebuild the city, it was gentrified. Um, and so I think that if we want to come alongside communities and build them up, we need to also give them a chance to build it up um, in a manner that's best for them. Um, so that's, that's my piece on that question. No, All right, Algeria, this is Dwayne. Um, we did have a hand raised. Great. Um, so I'm going to open it up to uh, first to Jill Underhill. So give me a second, Jill, to unmute you. But while I'm doing that, I just wanted to say so far in the last 10 minutes, we've raised $700. So amazing work and your immediate advocacy, everyone. That's fantastic. All right, Jill, I'm asking to unmute you. So hopefully you should be able to talk now. Uh, I did not have a question. Oh, okay. Then. <laughs> <laughs> but right. thank you. Um, you got it. The next. All right. So the next hand then is uh, Denard. Uh, let me unmute you. Awesome. Thank you, Dwayne, uh, for unmuting. I just wanted to see if I can actually try to provide or elucidate some of that 
question uh, simply because, uh, Dwayne, you probably already know this, but I am currently uh, at a uh, Christian institution seeking my Master's of Divinity and also Master's in Social Work. So this is a question that's near and dear to my heart, a question that a lot of my colleagues within the seminary that have already left and uh, are currently in the seminary with me. I've, my, my calls have increased simply because this is a question that come, has come to up on numerous ways and numerous facets. The, my primary challenge is uh, to, especially to those that question or ask the question, how do I bridge the chasm? Uh, and how do I provide or facilitate the conversation and help my congregation or those that are under my guidance is the first thing I always start with is, it's a Ravi Zacharias uh, who recently passed off apologetics uh, approaches, question the questioner, you know, um, and including yourself. You know, we've learned how to question everything about life besides our own beliefs, which I believe that's one of the questions that we have to always ask essentially what role do I play in this? Um, within my own denominational belief, I've challenged uh, it on a macro level, um, an individual level, um, but the macro level is where I'm seeking to seek more of the changes. Uh, in my experience, my experience currently is the reverse. Uh, I help pastor predominantly white uh, congregations. And uh, I'll just share a brief experience and I'll make my final point. Uh, uh, in one of the, in a rural white area near an Amish community, a predominantly white church, after speaking for my first time, I recall there's this tradition in most churches after you're done speaking at the end, you're actually doing a handshake. I recall individuals did not want to shake my hand. Uh, and one individual told me that if this was three years ago, he would have shot me in the face. Now, there's numerous things you can do in that moment. There's body language responses. But the good thing I can say, three years later, um, he shared with me like his entire life story. Uh, we found common ground. He's, he always seeks for me to come to speak. Um, so there's, there's the journey that we have to take as it happens organically on its own, you know. Um, but there's also where in this conference, I've challenged them to just look at the scholarship aspect within our seminary. How can they actually offset some of the financial strains for a majority of our international students and black minority students? I challenge our conferences to make sure that similar to our, uh, hopefully our electoral systems that we have representation that matches the people that we're actually servicing and soliciting to provide this education to. Um, so, I just tell, tell them to look at the numbers. And that's one of the realities, look at the numbers. But on an individual level, I would just start by saying, ask the, ask the question and the question, question like, uh, is it, why do you want to know this information? What's important in knowing this information? Are you just trying to intellectualize it? Is it a heart decision? Is it something that uh, you want to move forward in? And, and the most important question is, what role have you played in either exacerbating this issue um, undermining it or are considering a conversation for it. So that's where I would say, and there's numerous resources. I, and my final thought, I got an opportunity uh, to participate in a racial policing and a theology cohort at Howard University. There, there are some resources there that uh, when I actually, after, after the call, I'll send it out uh, to, to you as well, because uh, I believe that actually helps in the conversation on how uh, community churches who at one point in time were at the forefront of these uh, these social justice issues and now there are current like nonprofit uh, guidelines that could pro provide some logistical issues on how to approach it but I think there's still resources that gives us uh, language and purpose on how we can actually move forward with it but I think it's a great question thank you Denar. that was Great response. Look inward, figure out why you're asking that question. Absolutely. I think, you know, as we've talked about a lot of racial injustice issues, um, I've seen a lot of things where it talks about how sometimes our, our white counterparts, our white social workers will ask, how can I help? Um, what can I do? But sometimes it's just out of a, a need to feel better. Um, and 
we need to make sure that we're not just trying to feel better, but that we're actually really committed to um, trying to do good, right? Um, on the on the ha behalf of just doing the right thing, because we believe that other lives are worthy and, and they matter as well. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next question that we got. If that's all right, if no one else had a comment. Hi, Algeria. We do have a couple other hands raised. Okay. All right. So next we'll go to um, Angela Gardner. So let me go ahead and unmute your line, Angela. Hi. I am a school social worker in Detroit Public Schools Community District, and I am extremely concerned about the inequitable uh, funding that our students receive based on tax-based dollars. Um, and so moving forward, um, I know that we're, we're a union district, um, and the union has always um, focused on things that really um, are not very relevant for me. Um, I would like to know how we could uh, um, shape or introduce legislation so that the tax-based dollars are evenly distributed among all communities in the, in the state of Michigan so that our kids can have equal access um, to quality education because I believe that this is a, a cornerstone in, um, in, in what precipitates some of our problems. And um, I think if we do this, we could um, see, um, you know, change in a, in a very valuable way. Absolutely. Um, well, I will say for those on the call who are very inv interested in, um, making changes as it relates to funding. Uh, we're at the portion of our state budget um, where our budget, state budget is being set, right? It has to be set by legislators uh, by July 1st, uh, according to statute. Um, so many of our legislators are trying to figure out what we can do budget-wise. Um, the school aid fund is separate from our general fund that focuses on, um, you know, MDHHS and other departments um, that we see a lot of social workers in. Um, so I would say, you know, right now is the time to really um, get involved in the state budget um, and, you know, it's look at that school aid budget and figure out, um, you know, where we should be investing. Um, we also have our Michigan School of uh, our Michigan School Social Workers Association um, that works a lot on uh, not only school social work issues but education issues. There's a group of advocates here that focuses on, um, you know, early I'm, child early I'm a, child care education things of that sort. I'm a member of MASW and I'm aware of that organization, but I just don't see the tide shifting um, in this area to recognize how the tax base credit um, impacts public edu education as a whole. And my second, my second concern is um, as clinicians, um, is it possible that we could possibly do an FBA on racism and then prescribe a BIP um, to address racism in our communities. Could you speak a little bit more to that? I think also, I, I, I wonder if people are looking at the uh, chat as well, because there's a lot of good chats that are coming up alongside of your comments, Angela. Um, Michelle says, it's very important right now to be careful of um, requesting additional tasks of black people when they're hurting from systemic racism, hurting from um, things like right now that are happening in the education system. Um, so some members in the community may be open uh, to figuring out how else we can help uh, uh, create some healing. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, and I agree. To what you I, I agree. However, I do believe that the time is ripe for us to take action and seize the moment. And when we see disparities that are impacting um, 
you know, um, generations and generations and generations of children, then that could be our foci. And so as a result of that, this tax base credit that is uh, disproportionately distributed among school districts should be looked at and we should try to introduce legislation or um, tackle legislation so that our children will reap the same benefit of children in um, other counties and other communities. And so um, what I'm saying is that the time is ripe to seize the moment to ensure quality and equity is um, produced in public education. Absolutely. Thank you for um, those comments. I would actually love to talk with you a little bit more um, moving forward here in the future um, about some of those things. So absolutely. Thanks, Angela. I think as we also think about school social work specifically in the Detroit area, one of the things that we know is that there's a critical shortage of school social workers in that part of the state. And so I think as a field, uh, figuring out how do we recruit to make sure that those positions are uh, funded well and paid well is one thing that we know as a, as a field we can look towards, as well as getting social workers on school boards and other elected positions that in, may impact the funding streams that or the allocation that go on um, in those districts themselves are, is really critical. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and open up our next line. Um, Michael West, let me give you just a second and unmute. All right, Michael, if you could unmute your line, you should be good to speak. Okay. Hello, how how's everyone doing today? Good. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, my comment is, is basically, there needs to be education about the black community, period. Now, if you look at Maslow hierarchy of needs, the, the, the bottom two, the so, uh, psychological needs and the safety needs are really being, are really being taken away from black America. We don't have the housing. We don't have the, we don't have the, we don't have the housing. That's why our education are, are bad. That's why we're going to jail at high rates. Um, it's because of the fact that there has been this systemic problem about the perception of the way black people are. We can't get the loans. I just saw something on the money report how um, big companies, when they see your see what name you have, they're gonna they're gonna not give you a loan based upon your name. And if it's one of the ethnic names, they definitely throw it apart. And and to support my claim, to support my claim on this, MSN has an article that you can Google and you can look it up that says uh, the ten worst states for blacks in America, and it's based upon um, home ownership, incarceration rate, and unemployment. All of those three things right there contribute to the keeping down of Black America. If we can't get jobs, if we can't, if we can't have home ownership, then there's no way, no matter how much money you put into the school, the, schools are, the children in the schools are not going to be able to perform because the other needs are not being met. If you don't meet the other needs, if you don't meet these needs, if we, if we dance around this subject and we don't meet the, the entire need and we only try to do this sectionally, it'll never work. And, and if you look at it, in this article, I was really surprised because it's not a lot of the Southern states that you would think it was. And, and to be honest with you, Michigan is number six on the list. So that means there's a lot of things that are going, that, that means there's a lot of, things that are going on that we don't understand. And I go, and I'm in what they call UPORFA. It's a military organization that we go every year to South America and we meet with a lot of the other countries to talk about, um, you know, the veterans and the plight of the veterans. And I was told one time that, you know, that I represent um, black America. Most people only see what the stereotypical blacks are on the TVs, on the, on the, on the other, on the uh, TVs and on the radios and the things that you see as stereotypical black people. 
and they say that, you know, my representation it really goes a long way because most people don't know what Black America looks like, except for what you see perpetuated on the TV. We see the gangster type individuals perpetuated on TV. If we don't stop these type of things first, if we don't do these, those other things are nice, but if we don't start doing these other things, then we're not going to get ahead of the curve. These things are going to continue to go on. And so um, I don't want to mon monopolize the time, but I think that that's where we have to start. We have to start at the needs, babe. We got to start at the basic bottom and work our way up. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Michael. I think also, um, you know, Max brings up a, a, a good point. I don't know if you wanted to share your point, Max, as well, um, just about how important and critical it is that we run for our local offices, whether it's to sit on a school board, um, to, you know, sit on your local commissioner's boards, all of these things. Like, yes, we need, I think there's two things, right? Like, we can keep saying, like, we need to focus on policy, which we know we need to focus on policy. That's that's a given. Like, we definitely need to do that. Um, but almost sometimes that becomes, like, an easy cop-out, right, to say, yeah, we need to focus on legislation, or yeah, we need to focus on policy or, or whatever, running for office. And for some, that can be a very complex system, um, very daunting, and it puts responsibility on a few to actually engage in that initiative. Um, but I think we have to do both. We have to continue to look inward, not necessarily for black folks, right, but for white folks to continue to look inward, to focus on, on dismantling your own privilege, but also engage in systems change as it relates to policy. Um, we're hearing from a lot of our uh, black social workers on the line, like Michael and like Angela, that are saying that what needs to be done. Um, and I hope that everyone is listening and hearing. Um, but for my black social workers and black folks on the phone, yes, being involved on those local school boards, showing up um, and uh, looking at those school aid budgets, focusing on those basic needs, um, as Michael mentioned, is very important. I don't know if we have folks on the line who are not in the field of social work, but for folks, if there's anybody like on that corporate side um, who can, you know, try to push the needle on um, those corporate organizations to give back to the community to help those communities meet uh, basic needs, I think that's important as well. Um, so I'll stop talking so we can hear from others. All right, I will open up the next line, uh, Amanda Brown. Thank you. Um, I read an interesting quote um, from NPR. They interviewed this man, Alex S. Vitali, I think the last name, um, and he's an author of a book, The End of Policing. Um, and this line was really shocking to me. Um, he said, part of our misunderstanding about the nature of policing is we keep imagining that we can turn police into social workers. Um, and I'm not saying I agree with him or um, I condone, you know, everything that's been happening um, from police brutality, but I'm curious as, as a career, our field, um, it was in my experience in grad school that majority of the students were doing clinical work, doing the micro work, which is definitely necessary. But do we need to like have a shift to the macro work, like being in the community to work with the families to bring this um, sort of restoration and this um, community outreach? Um, I'm just curious what people's thoughts are to that. Um, I'm just reading here. So I would say I don't think that any of us are advocating for police officers to be social workers. Um, our profession is um, complex and there are certain tools that are needed that social workers can do best at. Um, so when I mentioned before uh, SB, 945 and training police officers on 
um, mental health techniques, right? We're still advocating that social workers be in police offices, um, doing the clinical work alongside um, police officers. But we need our social workers in the macro spaces like where I am, right, who can, or even other professors who are implementing these research initiatives, um, knowing what type of uh, mental health training is best needed and is culturally responsive to communities of color, and then taking those recommendations to bodies like MCOLS who um, set those law enforcement standards and saying, hey, this is the training that we think is needed and could best help uh, communities of color's anti-racism work. Um, so I think we do need social workers everywhere. We need them in the micro spaces, but we definitely need them in the macro spaces. There's not many um, it, there are macro social workers, but um, we still need more. Um, it's not many, um, as many as there should be uh, doing this work. Um, I'm thankful to know quite a few in this role, but we definitely need more. Um, so that's my comment. I didn't know if we wanted to open it up to anyone else, Dwayne. Sure, so our next, um, and is Todd E. All right, Todd, you should be able to unmute your line. All right, I'll come back to Todd in a minute. Uh, Katie Jones. Hi, um, I am a grad student at one of the schools of social work. Um, and I was, I, I know that right now, um, uh, there's, you know, there are a lot of conversations about like revamping curriculum um, around race and, you know, people are, people are ready to act and that's, Great, but I guess I'm curious. I was really surprised, you know, before this at what, I, you know, I guess personally, I didn't find that our cultural competency was that um, pushed, I guess. Um, it seemed like uh, those were often the sections that we could just skip if we wanted to of our textbooks. Um, and yeah, it, it, it really surprised me, I guess. And I just wonder, um, even though I'm sure a lot of schools will be doing things on their own, I just wonder what the NASW can do to require more um, of a focus on that, I guess, going forward, because we're all going to be working with people from different cultural backgrounds. Um, can I, I know if you wanted to answer? Oh, sure. Yeah, please. Um, because we are meeting with deans and directors and part of our ask is exactly what you're saying. Um, and it goes beyond cultural competence. It's about cultural humility. And um, we're trying to really and really encourage universities and several of them, many of them actually are, are becoming aware. It's unfortunate that um, what's occurred is what is heightened the awareness. But I think um, if we can look at the protests that are occurring and the students outcry, um, you're being heard and NASW is by your side and we're pushing for enhanced training and cultural humility. Great, Max. Um, I would yeah. just like to add to that. CS, CS, CSWE did release a statement this week um, that I just want to read. I put it in the chat box, but they, they said that social workers are called to address racism and all forms of social injustice. The education provided by more than 800 accredited programs is meant to prepare students to act on this ethical principle. Therefore, we must take this moment to honestly examine how social work curriculums go beyond teaching and appreciation for physical or cultural diversity and empower the next generation of social work practitioners to dismantle institutional racism. 
I think that CSWE, this is a great statement put out by them, but I think what we all need to do is make sure that we are sending recommendations, research, that we are getting um, a diverse range of folks on CSWE's board, on NASW Michigan's board, in leadership roles within the field, and at our academic institutions. Um, I think what we can do is continually call on CSWE um, and our, our statewide schools of social work to make sure that they're actively um, addressing this. And we know some of our schools are doing amazing stuff right now. Um, and so, you know, wherever you all have your our alumni from, I think that's a good starting point. And then what's local? I know as NASW, like Max said, and Algeria said, we partner with many of our schools of social work in the state. Uh, we have 35 schools of social work in Michigan. So we are very rich in terms of uh, social work programs. We have the largest number of bachelor's level students of any state in the United States at about 4,000. And then we have about 2,500 MSW level students. So we have tons of folks across the state um, and tons of new professionals that are, are gearing up. And I think that this call for social justice um, within our curriculums is really, really critical, especially integrating it more into the clinical curriculum. Um, but I will go I ahead say and one thing. For, for, sure, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just reading the comment in the chat box, and someone said there needs to be history classes offered through social work programs on the African American experience. Um, there would be a better understanding of what is happening now. Um, and I want to, I don't know, I agree, but then also I think like, um, with depends on what university you're at. There are some universities, right, that have Africana Studies programs, that have Native American pro, uh, Studies programs. Um, and like I remember my university had a, we had a African American Resource Center where um, unfortunately because it was a, a, a PWI, there was not um, many opportunities in other programs um, to take classes and to learn that history. We had to get that um, through our Africana Studies courses. Um, but I took them. I took quite a few of them. Uh, they were some of the best and hardest classes I've ever taken. And I think if you are at universities that have those, um, take those courses. Don't wait for the schools of social work to uh, um, to bring those courses in. We should have them in our profession, but um, if we don't and they're still available to you on campus, I definitely think that um, you should take those as well. Um, so, uh, Dwayne, did you want me to read another question or we want to just uh, go forward and continue to open the let's, conversation? Let's continue with who's on the line. Um, so, let's go ahead and open up the line to uh, Jessica Comrie. Hi, um, I was just wanting to see what your thoughts were on um, systemically how to, I guess, intervene and prevent racial bias from um, increasing in individual police officers. I've been reading about some um, police forces wanting to enforce and increase like racial bias training um, and have also wanted to see more like if it's feasible to have required like individual therapy services and support group services, just mental health services in general, be a requirement for police forces as a way to intervene as well as um, and prevent some of racial biases from um, developing in police officers. So I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on, um, I guess, racial bias training as well as um, like requiring um, police departments to provide ongoing mental health services for police officers as a preventative way of them escalating their responses and crisis to excessive force. Yeah, so I can speak to this a little bit. Um, so as it relates to implicit bias train, training, like I just mentioned not too long ago, we did support um, the passage of SB 945, which was a, some legislation to create implicit bias training within the police, within the law enforcement here in Michigan, as well as to teach them um, mental health, um, uh, take for them to take uh, required mental health training. Um, there is no evidence, though, that you know implicit bias um, 
uh, training works or that folks will take it seriously, police officers will take it seriously. So we're very critical of it. Um, we know that we need to um, move in the right direction and we're hoping this legislation does move us in the right direction, but we definitely are um, going to remain critical of the curriculum that comes from it um, and who's doing the training and things of that sort. Um, so that's where we are on that. I know there are police officers police departments, law enforcement um, divisions that do offer mental health uh, training for, or mental health um, sessions for uh, police officers. I know in Kentucky, uh, for example, they do have um, some social workers who provide uh, mental health support uh, to police officers. Uh, I think um, it's needed for them just as much as it's needed for, for social workers. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open up our next line. Elena um, Gormley. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I am a master's social work student I'm doing and will be doing a macro specialization. And like one concern that I have is that there's been this overarching narrative of police shouldn't be social workers and therefore we should be reallocating more resources for there to be more social workers doing these kind of frontline de-escalation and crisis intervention. And I have a very significant concern with that in that there is already a major aspect of social work is very much surveilling marginalized people in marginalized communities and frequently providing services in a very coercive context. Um, I'm thinking about like some, a lot of drug treatment programs, um, programs uh, for women who are involved in, in child services. Um, and that already like comes with a lot of ethical concerns um, because you know if you are providing these kind of services because if they don't attend your program they get incarcerated that's violating the individual's right to self-determination and just like if our new model is instead of having the strangers with guns try and intervene in conflicts we have unarmed strangers with manila folders that can you know that can that are still mandated reporters that can still you know you know d depending on what they report and document out can lead to further social um criminal justice involvement that's not a good replacement um so as we consider um alternatives to policing um we need to when we consider the role of social work in that we need to also completely restructure social work because this heavily professionalized and credentialized version of community care has really been quite a quite a disaster for a lot of folks and that's i think something that we need to have some hard self self-reflection and really make some major changes around thank you um, okay, I Thank will you open up the line next. Um, Angel Gomez. Hi. Um, so I'm a grad student at uh, Saginaw Valley uh, State University, and I'm also the president of our social justice rapid response team. And um, we are having a meeting so that way we could address uh, change on our campus. Do you have any um, recommendations how we can address change so that way students in other disciplines can learn about um like the black lives matter movement um african-american history something along that lines that they don't they don't get the choice whether or not they get to take the class Max, did you want to answer this? I can answer. I, I I would just throw the question back at you. You know, like kind of what is stopping you from creating change? You know, I'm sure that you're not the only person that um, feels this way and thinks this way. It's strategically figuring out who you need to press um, to make sure that these changes happen. Um, I just keep thinking back to 
my time in undergrad when uh, the Ferguson riots happened. And then next thing you know, we had um, uh, Sam DeVos was killed um, by an off-campus police, um, by a, police, a, a university police um, who was off-campus, who was actually in the city. And a lot of um, black students, they came together and white students came together um, and they put pressure on exposing a lot of the university's racism, right, and um, working with um, their allied uh, professors who had tenure um, to create some change to require different things within the university. Um, so I think you need to start by figuring out, like, who are your go-to people, your go-to professors who can support you, your go-to student organizations that can support you. I think creating university change can sometimes be difficult, and this is just my, my opinion. And if there are professors on the line who can also, you know, weigh in on this, that would be great. We'd love to open it up to you. Um, but I think it can be difficult because your time there is so short um, and you're juggling so many different things. Um, so you'll need to rely on um, professors and organizations and staff members who are going to be around even when you aren't there to continue to champion that change when you're gone. Um, so I don't know if that was the best response, but that's just my opinion to that to your question. I guess to, uh, I would add to, to add to what you're saying, Algeria. Um, I think that the time to act um, is now and that you can um, begin to organize by yourself by contacting others across disciplines of similar perspectives and bringing people together. Um, it's kind of the whole idea of community organizing. You're doing community organizing on your campus. And I would just add to that too, that um, here in Michigan, we have about 600 to 700 student members of NASW alone. So don't think that you need to work on this by yourself. I think there's already a really big pool of folks that we can reach out to and we can help you network with, regardless of um, which, what your size of your program is um, or kind of the capacity of your, your school of social work. So I think, again, you know, that's where we as an association might be able to be helpful. It's, you know, part of our, our role, and I say this a lot, is we are the social worker's social worker. So whatever you all need as professionals, whether it's a resource, a training, a network, an advocate, that's what we exist to be. And so I think there's a lot of things that are, can come out of this call um, where we as an association really can thrive, and that's where we need more conversations like this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open up. I know we're getting to kind of the end. We've got about eight minutes left, so we'll probably only be able to get to one, maybe two more uh, comments, and then we'll have to start wrapping up. Uh, but I'm going to open it up to uh, Bree Davis. Hello. Um, I am a clinician Hi, for the Community Mental Health Center here in Muskegon, Michigan. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Yes, um, so my... My comment or my concern um, was kind of going back onto some of the um, cultural diversity or cultural humility um, trainings and whatnot for our police force in different communities. And I'm just wondering, from my experience here in Muskegon, um, it appears that a lot of the people that serve on our police force, our medical field, and in our school field are people that actually commute from different communities um, that are usually of a different cultural or ethnic background than those they serve here in Muskegon. Um, and I'm just wondering how can we start to, or if some communities elsewhere have started to encourage their natives of the community to be more involved in example, their police force, or how can we just create more of a community field to get more hands-on experience and exposure to learn about the epistemic privileges of those in the community that people are often commuting to to serve. I think you bring up a really good point. Um, as you were talking about that, I was also just thinking about the ways in which, um, just even in our profession, like how our field placements operate, 
um, how we often have folks um, going into various different communities that are not from there and coming with a lens, um, with their own worldview, their own lens, right, when trying to tackle or, or work with folks or anything like that. Um, so I just, uh, when you said that, I, I thought of that as well. Um, but I think you have to, I know one thing that a lot of advocates are demanding right now is like community-based oversight boards for these um, police departments and divisions. Um, you know, making sure that people who are in these hiring roles um, are, are doing a better job and that we're holding each individual organization accountable. Um, so I think we have to, to start there and um, put the power back into the hands of the community. I think those things are happening for a reason. Um, and I don't have all the answers um, to give you uh, for this. I think it's very complicated and complex, but um, I agree that mm -hmm. we do need to put those who are from the community into those spaces um, because they know best. Like, you know your community best. Um, you know the, the struggles and the difficulties and the resilience that your community has, unlike anybody who um, is coming from 20, 30 miles away. Um, yes. So, yeah, that's, that's my piece on that. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering. Did we lose her? Okay, sounds like we, I don't know, maybe she got muted. Um, sorry, Bri, I accidentally muted you. You should be able to unmute yourself again. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I was just wondering if anybody had any knowledge of any other communities starting to maybe involve community members in some of the hiring of their police force, the sheriff's positions, or if anybody has, if any communities have already started to maybe take some lead in this and how we could maybe adapt some of that. I would definitely um, look at um, just some of the initiatives that the Detroit Justice Center is leading. Um, they're looking at ways in which they can reinvest like in their community. And I don't know if they boiled it down deeply to um, this particular topic, but they are looking at how they can use uh, organizations in their community to fund like um, community-based restorative justice centers, um, other different mechanisms besides policing. Um, and so I would just take a look at that organization and see how they're shifting power and shifting resources um, and, and maybe reach out to them as well to see um, how to tackle some of those, those initiatives that, that you're asking about. Because I don't have the answers for that. Thank you. So I know we have a few minutes, but I know there was one question that was sent over, and I know we still need to talk about um, our action steps. Um, but I thought this question was important to ask because I feel like other folks might have it. Um, it says, I'm seeking clarification on the responsibilities of agencies and leadership. Are agencies required based on the code of ethics to educate staff on racial injustices and to provide opportunities for education and growth? Or is it a, the decision of an individual agency to determine if they wish to address social injustices and concerns on an agency level? I understand the code of ethics is to be the foundation in which practices are developed and provide guidelines on how to address various issues that arise, but I'm calling into question the discretion if any, an agency possesses to determine uh, what they choose to address. Um, so, uh, Max, I'm wondering if maybe you can answer this question because other folks may be just trying to figure out, you know, maybe not on this large macro level, but what and how can they create change in their own agency? Uh, and what sure. is the role of their leadership? 
The hard part is that there is no requirement. The good news is that as social workers, we're bound by our code of ethics to address these issues. And this is a time to be active and to meet with the CEO of your association or your organization. We bring it to their attention that you feel there's a need for that and that as a social worker, you're willing to help to begin to set it up. Um, and I serve on the Clinton Eaton Ingham Community Mental Health Board. And um, at one of our HR meetings, um, I spoke up and said that I felt that we could not leave the meeting without talking about the death of George Floyd and what that meant for, um, for CMH. And it ended up in a very dynamic discussion and the CEO, Sarah Lurie, wrote this very, very, very powerful statement to all of the CEI, CMH employees into the community that CMH serves. So that's an example of we need to not sit idly by, which is my, my motto these days, but really give voice to ourselves and to talk to the CEOs, the supervisors, the managers. You can make a difference. Awesome. Thank you, Max. Um, so I think we need to kind of wrap up our discussion. I think this was really rich, and obviously um, we can continue to have so many more of these. We haven't even scraped the surface on some of this stuff. I think we spend a lot of time talking about police brutality um, because that is the focus. But like I said before, we need to tackle systemic oppression and racism on various different fronts. Um, I want to turn it over here just for a second to Dominique Golden um, to kind of talk about, um, to just gauge you all's interest in an active solidarity that uh, we're considering. Awesome. Thank you, Algeria. And um, this kind of came about uh, just to provide a bit of context here. Um, over these last few weeks, I know I've experienced a vast amount of emotions from um, sadness, um, being upset, angry, depressed. And um, one day I remember I got up um, right when most of the riots started. And I just happened to put on my Be The Change shirt um, that Max is also wearing today. and. <laughs> I had to realize that, wow, like I'm a social worker and I, I want to see a change here and how can I really shift my focus from feeling all of these emotions to try and create some type of um, social change. So I thought about how, how I could do that as a social worker. So um, I thought it's also important that social workers be heard and be visible in the public um, especially right now, um, when we're, we work privately day in and day out with our clients. Um, and I think sometimes it's really important for us to also share that publicly. And before I share just this um, more insight on um, an act of solidarity, I'd like to also share with you that impact is shown in many different ways. And this may not be an impact or route that you would like to take, but um, Algeria and Duane have also shared many ways of impact that you can take as well. So I just wanna make sure um, I honor that and validate that to support everyone in the routes that they choose to take um, to, to advocate for some type of change for what's going on right now. So um, with the support of NASW, i um, like to just ask for your support in making a date happen that would really support um, three key areas for us. And first, the goal of in this act of solidarity would be to one, amplify the voice of our social workers across Michigan. It would be two, to really mobilize us as social workers to come together and create a movement that empowers us as we empower the clients we serve daily. Um, and most importantly, which we've kind of talked through on this call today is that 
uh, Dwayne also shared, or, or NASW social media shared um, a post last week that said that social work is political. And, you know, part of, of these um, initiatives that is our duty as social workers to really advocate um, in, in, in voice um, and for our clients, right? And whether that be an initiative that supports criminal justice reform or clean slate that works to transform healthcare experience for people suffering from opioid and alcohol addiction um, and other local initiatives, I really want to encourage us to step into our power and own that because we're whether we're just starting out or we're seasoned professionals, there's a lot of expertise in this room right now um, as we're talking. And also outside of here, all of us have friends and, and um, networks within the social work profession. And I really am excited for us to get passionate and come together as one unified, um, and, and create a movement here that really lets our voice be heard. Because I don't know about you, but I really felt that there's been a gap in the social worker voice in the midst of everything going on. And we know this has been maybe an opportunity before, but I would just really love for us to gather um, like never before and really advocate for ourselves. So, I mean, when things come up and, and power tables are being created by other local um, and state state reps, you know, they think of social work and they, you know what, oh, you know, where's NASW? We need a member here because they're always out there advocating. I just, I just want us to have more of a face out there in the community, right? Because most of the times when things like this is going on with protests or what have you, um, there's no voice of social work. There is and I know there may be some other things going on and, and I wanna be sensitive to saying that because maybe there's something or interview I haven't seen, but I want there to, to be um, a powerful movement of us and to be considered um, because a lot of people are making choices for our clients and they're not including us. And how can that really happen, right? How can real change happen when, when we're in there day in and day out? So I say all this to say, in order for this to happen, if this is something that feels right to you, um, in order to make this happen, ASW needs your support. And um, a way we can do this is that um, I've been talking through with Algeria and Duane, and um, they've been sharing some of this information with, with Max and how it would align with our overall goals. And um, been working on a, a an Excel doc that will really kind of break down areas where we would need support. And although we're still working through the details of what an act of solidarity may look like, um, we really are being um, conscious of the COVID-19 um, regulations right now it would be difficult for us to meet in person or on campuses. So we're really trying to navigate those things to create an opportunity for us to come together um, in a very impactful way, in a way that will help us have um, a bit of long-term success or an opportunity to create long-term change. So it's not just one day we're getting together. So with all of that said, if this is something that you'd like to get involved in, um, please email me. I'm gonna put my information in the chat um, and please put in the subject line that um, interest of interest for active solidarity, your first and last name, phone number, email, and how you would like to volunteer. And I also put kind of the areas that we're, we're seeking um, volunteers, but more information will be to come. Um, so I thank you for your time. I thank you, um, Duane, Max, and Algeria for all that you're doing. Um, I'm really excited to be a social worker. I'm passionate about it. Um, I'm entering this field and I'm still learning so very much. So I look forward to hopefully uh, meeting you guys at this future opportunity um, that we can come together and really unite and be the social workers that we know we are and to show the world that. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dominique. I want to say, you know, if we do an, an, a day uh, after solidarity, whatever that looks like, 
I still want to encourage and continue the social workers to show up beyond that, um, to, to do, um, engage in, in this work beyond, um, you know, uh, optical ways, right, beyond social media, beyond marches and protests and things of that sort, but to really be closely connected with us and organizations in the community on the ground uh, to make this radical transformation happen. Um, so while we have you all here, I just want to share a few dates that I think are important going forward that we'll, we'll continue to have some of these conversations. So we'll continue to have um, these Zoom calls um, here in the coming week. Um, to try to hold space for social workers and to try to work through um, some action steps. Um, but we're also uh, going to focus on tackling this and educating social workers at our LEAD conference. LEAD is our Legislation and Education Advocacy Day conference. We have it every year. It mostly consists of student social workers um, across the state and we get up to 800 to 1,000 uh, participants. Um, but this year we're going virtual. Um, so we're hoping that, um, you know, we can um, have you all join us uh, October 29th, um, and those details are on our website. Um, and Dwayne, I'll, I'll turn it over to you or Max um, to kind of wrap up and uh, close us out here. I want to thank and everybody for Max, time. before you wrap up, I just have a couple of quick things. Okay. Um, just make sure I did put in the chat box the link to uh, just a short survey we're asking folks to fill out in terms of what you would like to see coming out of today's conversation, if you're interested in getting involved in a task force or committee potentially, and what sort of topics you want to make sure we're continually talking about. Um, the other thing I just wanted to quickly update, I think I said this about halfway through our call when we had raised $700, we have doubled that and we are at $1,400 in this hour and a half conversation. So really yeah. wonderful yeah. job, social workers. It's our first time we've ever really tried to do a digital fundraising campaign. and <laughs> So I, I think that's amazing. So Max, I'll turn it over to you to wrap us up. Okay, I want to thank all of you for attending this meeting. Um, it's been more than a meeting actually. It's been a moving experience that's critical. Um, and um, I guess my take home, takeaway for all of you is to know that we can work together we can make a difference. And it is absolutely critical to join spirits with others of color and to be a strong united front. So um, thank you all for being here tonight. And, um, you know, again, please, if you're not a member of NASW, join. That it's through you that we're able to get work done and to do the kind of social justice activities that can truly make a change for the world and for Michigan. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone so much. I look forward to these conversations. Good night. Good night all. <laughs>